fun. I love the Holy Spirit. I just really love the Holy Spirit. He's full of surprises, and I believe he wants to surprise many of us tonight. Um, but, uh, um, well, let's just start here. Uh, this morning, you know, we're talking about um, hearing his voice, and we just uh, tail uh, off of that a little bit, and we are kind of Ending, ending up with Mark chapter 4, uh, verse 3 to 9. Oh, by the way, my husband's still, um, I, he's in Pleasanton. I double check. where are you today? He's in Pleasanton. <laughs> and uh, um, anyway, uh, ministry's going really well. He'll, he's there uh, through tonight, and then he'll be home sometime tonight, hopefully not too late. Uh, but it went really well. Um, and Pastor Tom is in Brazil. He's with the Arushias. Julio and Tina used to attend here. They used to actually uh, serve in the youth. And they're now youth pastors over in um, Minnesota, I believe. So it's amazing, you know, just how how you get to you get to um, uh, see people from your own house, you know, go off and be in ministry somewhere. So so the Arushias are in Brazil with their team. Uh, that Tom is now leading them. You see how that's all connecting. So so anyway, um, uh, just excited for for all of that. But we were in Mark chapter four. I I don't think I gave you any scriptures like that tonight, but hopefully we we can trail Mark four three to nine. First thing it says, what does it say? It says, listen, right? It says, listen. Isn't that what this morning was all about? It's about actually hearing the voice of God. So we have to position and posture ourselves to hear. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it, and some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away, and some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground, yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced some 30, some 60, and some 100. And he said to them, what does he say? He says, he who has ears to hear, okay, let him hear. And that really was all what this morning was about, you know, is listening, having ears to hear, developing your ear uh, to hear the voice of God because God, uh, because Jesus, who is the word by his very nature, is speaking, Okay, uh, the Bible is not closed. Okay, the Bi- the Bible is the foundation. It's it's the grid that we base everything on. And God, who is a genius, can can do wonderful, powerful things in your life. And you can always bring it back to the Word. You can always bring it back to His heart. You know, um, and and the way we actually begin to to learn His voice is by first immersing ourselves in the written Word of God. And you don't have to be a theologian. You know, the 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 Word is amazingly uh, complex, but it's amazingly simple. At the same time, uh, Psalm 19:7 says that that His word makes the simple wise. So, so that's good news for you. If you're dumb and you don't have much going on in your head, if you will just listen and obey to the word, you know you will be wiser than those who don't, and your life will reflect it. Okay, so so we want to we and, and and we're learning that that Jesus doesn't waste a word. Uh, you know, when he was in the, the boat with the disciples and he, he prefaced that whole trip, he says, we're going to cross over to the other side. And then a storm rose up and the disciples were all freaking out and afraid and Jesus sleeping during the whole storm. And he wasn't afraid because he said, we're going to cross over to the other side. That was that word of the Lord, that prophetic word. There was no, nothing to worry about. And many times we take the word of God casually. We take it just very flippantly, not realizing that his word is his word. You can take it to the bank. Amen. And so, so we're learning to hear, we're learning to listen, we're, we're learning to hear his word in our own heart and be able to know that it's him because that is something we know he would say because we read it in the word of God. That's his heart because we, we captured that from the word of God. And so he can speak to you, you know, um, outside of his written word, but you, you can capture his voice because it sounds like him. Um, you know, the, the, the one scene in the Bible where, um, uh, Jesus, uh, you know, he's, I can't remember what he did, but, but his, you know, the, the, um, his, our heavenly father speaks to Jesus from, from heaven, just straight out of heaven. And the people around him, you know, thank God they heard something, you know, they weren't so dull that they didn't hear anything. They actually heard the voice as well. But the, to some, it sounded like thunder and to, to others, it sounded like an angel, but Jesus is the one who recognizes father's voice. So we want to, we want to move past just where, um, uh, you know, we have faint recognition, but we actually know the voice of our father and we are led by his voice because one word will change your life. Can I have an amen? 
And so we're learning from the parable some of the hindrances uh, to hearing his voice. I'm not going to go over all of this again because I want to move past that. But we learned about um, uh, being on the wayside when you're on the edge, when you're emotionally sliding off the cliff and you're spinning. It's hard to hear God during that moment. And so you have to anchor yourself um, uh, to the Word of God, pin yourself to the Word of God uh, despite your feelings and the, the, the things that you don't do when you are spinning out like that because people go through a shaking like that. And God's trying to to get some things out of you. And Satan's trying to divert you all at the same time. And we learn that we don't quit our marriage. We don't don't quit our our kids. We don't quit our church, right? And we don't take our life. When you're spinning like that, you don't do any of those things. And then um, if you got to quit something, quit your job because you can get another, okay? And so, so, you know, and and then you anchor yourself. You pin yourself to the word. You begin to speak that word over your life. You begin to to do that. I mean, you you might just have one word, you know, that that God is is um, uh, working everything out for your good. That might be the only word you have during that season. He's working it out for my good, you know. And you you need to anchor yourself and pin yourself to that. Say that thing a thousand times, ten thousand times, twenty thousand times until it is drilled down. You are drilled down so deep that you're not going to get uprooted during those seasons. Okay. All right. So that was uh, being on the edge, being on the wayside. Uh, the next one was being shallow and superficial, actually getting your getting rooted, which again is when you pin yourself to the word and you learn to live the word despite what you feel, despite what your your spouse does. Let's say your spouse decides to not serve God. Will you still serve God? If your spouse decides to not worship the Lord, you still worship the Lord. Our relationship is not dependent on what our spouse does. Our relationship with God is not dependent um, on what our family does. If our family, you know, begins to, to um, you know, make uh, threats against our relationships with them because we want to serve Jesus, you know, wholeheartedly, um, you know what? You go ahead and serve Jesus wholeheartedly and just let the rest fall, t- you know, to the side there. Let, let be the example and be, be the, um, be the breakthrough in your family. Somebody has to raise a standard by taking a stand. That's how you do that. All right, so go ahead and be the forerunner. Um, So we don't want to be shallow or superficial. We want to be rooted. And we also talked about having a crowded heart, and that really has to do with um, uh, letting anxiety and letting cares and letting things get inside of you so deeply that that you can't even focus on Jesus. And a lot of that is not about not having responsibility, not having big stuff to do in this earth, but it really has to do with what's going on inside of you. His peace really does pass all understanding. You can have that kind of peace, even if you have a lot of responsibility, even if, if you're, you know, um, you end up being the governor of California, you end up being the president of the United States. His peace passes all understanding. It is a supernatural peace. I mean, it's a peace that you can't describe. It's a peace you can't define. And it, and it comes from, again, you know, uh, pinning yourself to his word, you know, casting your care upon him. Uh, you know, he, he will perfect the things that, that you care about. You know, I don't let my heart be troubled. And you might have to repeat that scripture, his written word is alive. You know, his written word is powerful. Um, you might have to repeat those words to yourself, over yourself, a thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand times, but you've got to drill it inside of you. We are in times and seasons that we cannot forsake the word of God if we're going to make it. We have to not only have that immersion in the written word, we actually have to know how to hear his word and actually be led by his spirit. Because those who are, are led by the spirit, they were, they're the sons of God. And, and that's really how we prove, it, prove that we, we belong to him, is we actually hear him, we're led by him. Okay, and so, so we have to learn to fine tune um, our ears. And then, you know, it, it finishes out saying that uh, those who hear the word, um, uh, they accept it, bear fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100. And that's really the progression of the, the fruit of the kingdom growing in your life. You know, I've always kind of heard that as, as kind of like a challenge, like, well, f- for some, some of, sometimes you'll get a 30-fold return on the word, and some, a 60, some 100, and it's kind of, you know, sketchy how that happens. I really see that as a progression of your life, a life that has decided to, to serve the Lord Jesus for the rest of your life. Like, we're not going to cut out in 10 years, 20 years. We're not going to cut out in 30 years and forsake the Lord. I've seen people lay 
lately. I'm like, you've been serving the Lord for 30 years, and you are now getting into that garbage? Are you kidding me? How do you lose your faith after 30 years of serving Jesus? Okay, so there's, there's always a time where we have, to const- we have to make it our lifestyle that no matter um, what place in life that we're at, that we posture ourselves to hear him, that we are continuously in his word, that we are continuously led by his spirit, and we never let that go. And we commit to finishing our race, finishing it all the way to my very last breath. I will praise the Lord. Amen. So, you know, just kind of keying off of that, I want to pull up that scripture out of Isaiah 55. I think it's verse 10 and 11. Yeah, it says, um, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. No, nor are your way. I think it's nor are your ways my way, says the Lord. Um, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Did he give you verse 10? I can't even remember what verse 10 is. If I didn't, that's okay. We're good enough. He's basically saying my ways are higher than yours, okay? My thoughts are higher than yours. And that's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a challenge. It almost feels um, a little disconnecting, almost like, you know, well, will I ever be able to, to experience God's higher thoughts, God's higher ways? Well, that's not a statement of, um, uh, you know, to disconnect you from that. It's actually kind of, it's an invitation, actually, to actually begin to learn and hear the higher ways of God, to learn and hear um, the higher thoughts of God, actually step into it your, yourself. And I believe that we are being invited to think in, in higher dimensions because the, the times and seasons call for it. We need higher strategies to actually unlock the nations. We need, we need um, you know, and we actually, we actually have to believe as a church that we can do that. You have to look at yourself and say, you know, if God called me to a, to, um, a, a very strategic place in our nation, either, you know, maybe as a, as a, a voice of righteousness or in government or um, in, in business or, um, you know, arts or something like that, if I get called to that, um, you know, can, can I represent the Lord um, with the strategy that he would have me represent him? And so it's, it's a call to higher ways. And if you don't think for a minute that the Lord won't use you. And, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, well, who am I? I don't even have the intelligence. I don't even have the education. Well, when God calls you, he actually equips you. He actually gives you the ability to do what you thought you couldn't do. I had shared this story before. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty close to the angelic realm. And I was standing in a conference line years ago, and I saw this angel come right at me. And it looked in his hand; it looked like it was carrying like it looked like a grid or, or something. That's the best way to describe it. And he threw that thing in my head. And then um, that night, I had a dream, and I, I saw a mathematical equation, a linear equation, just get dropped right into my head. You know, so I got this grid and this equation, this linear equation, something like that, uh, getting dropped into my head in a dream. And with the help of an angel. Well, one of the things I always struggled with is I, I struggled with organization. I struggled with seeing the big picture. Well, after that happened, all of a sudden I can see the big picture and I can organize at a higher level. I'm here to tell you that if God calls you, he'll equip you one way or another. You may or may not ever see an angel throw something in your head. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. You may or may not ever have a dream like that. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Okay, I'm here to tell you that God will equip you for what he's called you to. Never, never, um, uh, think for a moment that you are not a candidate um, for for something really powerful. I believe wholeheartedly that God is looking for people who will just say yes. You know, if you'll just say yes, if you'll say yes to it, if you'll say, here am I, Lord, send me. God is looking for the yes in the heart, and the rest of it will come together, um, you know, the way he desires to come to get it to come together. And so we're being invited to think higher. That's why I did the whole... Um, conference on uh, um, the Seer Institute on um, dream interpretation because that's a higher logic. You know, that's God's logic. I call it God's logic because dreams don't make sense. They don't make sense at all. This is why we dismiss it. And we dismiss so many dreams from God because it doesn't make sense. It's illogical. Not recognizing that, that he was in that. And, and recognizing that, that through our dreams, it's an invitation to think higher because he's trying to get a word to you. <laughs> He's trying to get you a word to, but he's not going to do it at this level. He's going to do it at this level because you're getting invited up higher. 
All right, and so we begin to, to learn, you know, the five steps on dream interpretation. So you at least get the gist, at least get the main message, you know what I'm saying, of what he's trying to say to you. Um, or you can help your friends who have those weird dreams and don't know God. Everybody has dreams. Uh, people have dreams from God that don't even know him. We see that in the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream, and uh, he didn't even know God. And so Daniel, you know, is the one who interpreted that. But um, anyway, you know, so, so we're being invited to think higher, we're being invited to hear his voice in a, in a, in a higher way because um, the times and seasons are calling for higher strategy, and we need to hear God at those levels. And, and he, he will teach you. Remember, the Holy Spirit is the best teacher in the world. He is the best teacher in the universe. He will teach you. God's ways. He will teach you his voice. He'll teach you symbols and signs and what those things mean. You look in the Bible and you see some of the poetic imagery, you know, that's in the Bible. I'm like, what does this mean? The Holy Spirit will teach you what that is about. He'll show you um, uh, how to reference that and how to to, uh, uh, break it down and get the keys out of that. Um, And so we're learning that, that God can speak to us whatever, in whatever way he wants to, and God speaks to us in a variety of ways. And we have to get it out of our head that, uh, you know, that we, we will only allow God to speak to us one way. It's like telling God, um, you can only speak to me on text and nothing else. You know what I'm saying? Or, or um, uh, just Twitter, you know, just one sentence. You know, I mean, really, okay? I mean, can you imagine your friends telling you that? Just talk to me on text. You know what I'm saying? You say, well, we have a text relationship, you know. It's, you know. Um, but, but really, you know, God is, is infinite, and he's creative, and he's the word. And so he's going to talk to you any way he wants to. So we have to, we have to get out of the box of how God is going to talk to us. He's going to talk to us any way we, we, you know, he wants to. And we need to, to um, you know, learn to recognize his voice in, in many dimensions. But when you get to know him, you actually do recognize him. I'll give you an example from the Bible. Moses, um, you know, remember that whole scene, and he's tending sheep. Um, you know, for his uh, father-in-law, and uh, he goes by the bush, Exodus 3, 3, he goes by the bush, and the bush is not being consumed in the fire. It says, then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, you know, so I think it's so interesting. And we look at that and we think, well, you know, um, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I've never had God speak to me out of a bush. But when we see the written word, the reason I'm telling you, you got to get in the written word is the written word opens us up to possibilities. Well, maybe he might not speak to you from a bush. He might speak to you out of a tree. He might speak to you out of a cloud. He might speak to you out of some other aspect of nature. Okay? It doesn't mean you're crazy. It doesn't mean you have to go to the psych ward and get a crazy pill. Okay, because hearing God is normal, and the way you discern if you've heard the voice of God or not is, one, be in a community like this, and two, you know, get some pastoral counsel from people who know how, how to decipher those things. And so, um, you know, and so it opens us up to possibility that God uses nature to speak. He uses nature to speak. I sh- shared this. I... I Elaine and I did this little video on this thing. <laughs> I mean, how many hits did we get on that? At least 8,000. I mean, you know, it's a little 15-minute video. Uh, at least 8,000, maybe more. Um, and, and all it was is the Lord started speaking to me about, I don't know, two months ago, six weeks ago. I can't remember about change. It was just one word in my heart over and over again, change, change, change. You know, and it was not just about myself. Um, I thought it was or it could be. It makes me anxious when the Lord says change. Like, change, what does that mean? Like, you know, how much change? What are you saying, you know? I like my life, you know? Don't touch it. And so, <laughs> leave it alone, you know? Um, I didn't know what he was saying, but it made me curious because I heard it in my heart. And I was coming home from night, night watch prayer, and uh, I noticed on the ground of the concrete going up to my door, I noticed on the ground there was a, a dragonfly on the concrete of all things. Um, it just struck my curiosity. My eyes just went right to that thing. It's 3 a.m., and um, I thought it was dead. I kicked it, and it just buzzed at me, you know, like, like you know, like, don't wake me up. Um, I felt the breath of God on that, and I thought, God's in that. I don't know why he's in that dragonfly, but he is. And so I just jumped on my computer inside, and I, I Googled, you know, symbolism for dragonfly. You want to know what it said? Some of you have already heard this. It said, uh, it's often a symbol for change. 
And I thought, oh, that's powerful, you know. God's saying something about that. I began to learn about transition and how, how um, dragonflies go through transition before they actually get their wings and, you know, how important it is to understand those transitions. And, and um, it's not just for us personally, but it's for us as a nation. And so we put that out there on a little video and it got picked up, and all these people started telling me they're seeing dragonflies. Even our bishop, Dave, he's like, I just saw 12 dragonflies. I counted them, you know. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, you know, and, and so what I'm saying is this, is, is God spoke through a bush. Well, then he's going to speak through nature, but will you know it when he does? Will you know it when he does? We'll be able to recognize it. We'll be able to identify it. And I've learned that God always confirms his word. It's never just something crazy out there. Like there is a definite step-by-step confirmation that he just spoke to you, okay? He, and he will take you there. So, so, you know, you can prove what he just said to you. Always remember that. You can prove it. There will always be proof. Um, I had the same, same thing happen to me um, uh, with praying mantises. I used to have praying mantises show up on my porch all the time. They're always on my doorknob. I'd have dreams about praying mantises, had no idea why. I'd have dreams about armies of praying mantises, had no idea why. And then somebody, you know, um, you know, we'd start praying around here and just having a real strong uh, prayer focus here. And, and most of you are involved in the, the, you know, one of the prayer services that we have each and every day. Um, you know, of course, and then we have the book, the Intercessor's Handbook, that's, you know, um, we just, that I just wrote, and it's come out of here. But... Um, I learned that the word mantis, way, way later in the game, I learned that the word mantis means prophet, praying prophet, praying prophet. And so, so you know, what was interesting is when I wrote the book and the first edition, and it started going out way farther than I thought I ever would, you know, I was like, wow, people are really picking this up. Um, and I had uh, more than one person say that when they would go sit down, like let's say outside to read the book, um, that a praying mantis would fly up to them. What was God saying? Well, when you see a praying mantis, it's time to pray. It's like God was creating his own marketing about prayer, you know, through an insect. Okay? And so my point is this, is is God's going to speak in whatever way he wants to speak. And, um, uh, you know, and we see in the Bible that he will speak to you through nature. Job, Job 12, 7 says, just ask the animals. They'll teach you. Ask the birds of the sky, and they will tell you. You know, I love it. You can always bank everything against the Word of God. You can always find it in the Word of God. Um, and uh, what's interesting is um, uh, Dave Williams, you know, again, I mentioned our bishop. He has uh, um, he has an organization called Club 52. It's a business organization. If you want to learn how to be a millionaire, you you join Club 52. You know, it's for, for people who want to be millionaires because he wants to fund the kingdom of God for the end time harvest. Okay, that's his whole thing. And he said he re- received a word from God several years ago to raise up 52 million millionaires in his church when he was pastoring, um, uh, you know, again, for the purpose of funding missions and world evangelism. And he said that was, a, at the time, that was a very challenging word. Can you imagine being tasked by the Lord, raise up 52 millionaires when you have maybe, what, none? You know what I'm saying? And so, and, um, and he said the way God confirmed that word to him is he sent a flock of birds, exactly 52 birds, right to his location twice. Twice. So Club 52, there it was. And then, you know, Tom Hamm, and Tom and I, you know, would go way back. And he used to experience angelic visitations with bird visitations. He knew because of the pattern of birds in his life that there was angels nearby. And it's not just, he doesn't just see a bird and he like, oh, there's a bird. That means there's an angel. It was very, very distinct. It got so uh, prevailing in his life. Like he, he can't keep windows open. He can't keep doors open because there'll be a bird that will fly in. And so, uh, and that even happened in Brazil. And once, this happened to him once, a bird flew and flew right onto his shoulder when he was walking and just stayed there as he walked around. Isn't that powerful? Uh, And then when he left here, um, he and his wife left here um, to go to Brazil, um, and Catherine and I, I don't know where Catherine is, Catherine and I were there, but we looked, and he was living across the street, and we looked at his tree, and his tree filled with like thousands of birds, I don't know if it was thousands, I just know the tree was full of these white birds, and they were so loud, they wouldn't shut up, and that was like, you know, the day before he left, and these things were just, wah, wah, you know, they're just screeching and talking to each other, but the whole tree filled up with birds, <laughs> 
okay? Here, I, I'm bringing the, all of this stuff out is that, you know, God's, God's ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. But he's inviting us to experience it, and it's fun. It's fun, okay? Um, one time I was teaching this, what I'm telling you right now, I was teaching this at, um, I think it was Bethel School of the Prophets, and I, I was talking about how God speaks uh, through creation, and, you know, some people look at me like I'm a little weird, you know, like, yeah, right, you know. <laughs> so, so one of the girls left the class, and she found this bird on her car, and she thought it was sick or dying or something like that. There's a bird just right smack on her car. And, and she took it, and she's trying to get it to fly away, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't fly away. So she just took the bird to lunch with her. <laughs> just took it to lunch, you know, <laughs> and uh, it ate lunch with her, and she just spent the lunch with her, um, and then when she drove back, she had the bird steal because the bird wouldn't fly, wouldn't leave her, and then um, right before she came back to the class, you know, she, she tried to release it and, it, and it flew up, and then it went right smack on her head. She got a picture of it and everything, just landed right on her head, just, you know, hung out there, and then she, she got rid of the bird finally, and then she went to class, but, you know, it's, it's very powerful what God will do. He will confirm that, yes, he does do things like that. Can I hear an amen? And then we see how, um, uh, you know, uh, let's skip this one, uh, about Elisha when um, uh, Naaman came to him, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house, and Elisha sent a messenger, and he told him in 2 Kings chapter 5, he said, go and wash in the Jordan seven, seven times. Now, the problem with Naaman is Naaman had leprosy, and so he's considered unclean. He can't, he can't really be associated with people, you know, because it's, um, it's uh, contagious or, and all of that. And so Elisha says to, he sends a message to Naaman, he says, go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean be clean. So Naaman goes to the prophet, you know, what, what should I do to get healed? And that's what he says. And so what happens with Naaman? Naaman is furious. He's furious at the instruction that Elisha gives to him because he was thinking that Elisha would just kind of wave his hand over him, you know, and, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know how it is. It's like when we say, let's pray for each other, you instantly put a hand on somebody and you command their body to be healed because that's what we've taught you to do. You know, you lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And so we all instantly do that. Well, I think Naaman wanted something similar from um, uh, Elisha. You know, just wave your hand or do something like that. Well, he didn't do it. He said, go dip in that dirty river, you know, the Jordan. Go dip in that, do it seven times. Isn't that kind of an odd thing? I mean, let's put it down into our time. What if somebody came up to you and you're sick, you, you know, you're, you're, your hand's peeling off, you know, you're losing a body part or something like that. And they're like, go dip in the canal for seven times, okay? And you're not even allowed to swim in the canal. You know, you're going to have to, you know, avoid those canal tenders and everything, but, but go dip in there seven times. And you're like, why don't you just lay hands on me? You know, like the Bible says right here, if you lay hands on the sick, they're going to recover. Why are you telling me to dip seven times? Well, that's what Elisha's telling him. And, you know, finally, the, the one slave girl convinces Naaman that that's what he needs to do because Elisha's, you know, knows what he's talking about. He does it, and he gets healed, okay? Now, again, I bring that out to tell you that those are possibilities, when you see it in the written word, that's a possibility. God might do it like that or something similar um, uh, like that. Do you remember uh, Jesus, um, you know, there was a man who was born blind. You remember that? And everybody's asking, you know, why is he blind? You know, um, uh, you know what it, what, what's his sin or his parents' sin or something like that? And, and so Jesus likes saying, you know, it's none of that. It's so God can be glorified in him. Uh, John 9, 6, it says, when Jesus had said these things, and he's, he's with the blind man right now, uh, he says, he spat on the ground. He made clay with the saliva. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to them, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated scent. So he went and he washed, and he came back seeing. I think that's so fascinating what the prescription was. Mud in the eye with spit. Go wash in the pool. And voila, it's all taken care of. Okay? Again, possibilities. Possibilities. Now, in studying all of this, you know, um, I'm a person when, you know, um, uh, you know, if I'm not feeling well, I'll go come up to the prayer line. I'll have, have them pray for me. You know, I'm, I'm actually very healthy. It's very, very rare that I get ill. You know, sometimes I do. But, but um 
But this one window of time, I got the strangest message from somebody, and she was from our institute, but she lives in Florida, okay? So I don't know her that well. And she sends me this note, and she says, um, the Lord told me that he is healing your vocal cords, and he's healing your respiratory system, and that he wants you to eat some pomegranates. And I thought, that is the weirdest thing. Now, you have to understand, I'm a very, you know, as much as I dive into the voice of God, I live in this realm, I'm still very logical and I'm still very analytical. Nobody's ever told me to do anything close to that. And I wasn't sick. I wasn't even sick. And I, I thought, you know, um, for some reason, I think there might be something to this. And so I thought, well, what can it hurt? Well, I can eat a pomegranate. Can you eat a pomegranate? I can eat a pomegranate. I'm not going to tell anybody about this. I don't even tell anybody, you know, just going to, I'm not even going to tell her. <laughs> so I went to the store, and I got some pomegranate seeds. You know, over in the store, they have it in the, the, the produce section. They have them in a little cup. You know, you can get a, get a whole cup of it. So I got a couple of those. I thought, well, what's it going to hurt? You know, so I did that. Next day, I am throwing up, feeling like I'm getting some major flu, like the kind that's going to go into your respiratory system and knock you out for like a month. I feel like I'm getting that, right? Within a couple of hours, the, at least the throwing up part passes. I feel like my body had been shaken by something. But, it, and it, but it's, like, it's like I went through the whole thing in like two hours, and then I was done with it, you know. And I thought, that is the strangest thing, you know. And, and um, um, it, it so floored me how that went down that I never even told her because I had to think about it for several weeks now. I actually just sent her a note this afternoon, and I told her, well, this is what happened. And I said, I normally don't pay attention to words like this because I think these words are kind of nuts. <laughs> and I was concerned that if I actually, like, jumped that bandwagon that I was going to get several more after, you know, like it. And I was like, I don't want to start that. You know, and I was afraid that if I told you this, that all of a sudden everybody's going to send me crazy words like that. Why don't you get a chocolate bar? You know, <laughs> Lord told me to tell you, eat some chocolate. <laughs> It'll help you be happy. <laughs> you know, I mean, honestly, that's what I was thinking. Is like, what gate am I opening if I, if I actually put that out there? But I thought to myself, I'm like, it's right in the word. It's right in the word. It's not, it's not, a, um, it's not an all the time thing. It's kind of an exception. But those exceptions exist. And I was glad I honored that exception because I did have a problem the next day and it didn't go where I was intending to go. <laughs> Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Amen? He's good, right? And so, so I believe, you know, um, what God is doing, and um, we can have the worship team come up. Um, what I believe God is, is doing is he is inviting us into to know his voice deeper. He's inviting us to, to participate in some depth when it comes to his ways, to actually, ex, you know, experiment with it. And, and you know how we are. You can make a mistake as long as you will admit it. Um, you can make a mistake on those things. Um, and, that, and that he's trying to get something into us about um, going deeper with his word and trusting his spirit, like knowing his word, but trusting his spirit, trusting the breath of God when he begins to breathe on something like that. And because he wants to actually unleash strategies to us to unlock cities and nations like they've never been unlocked before. I know that I know that he wants to release deeper deliverance to his church, um, that there's, there's places in our lives, places in our heart that are not delivered. I see Christians bound all the time. And it drives me up the wall. I'm like, how do we get to that? How do we get that out of them? And I know the Lord wants to deliver, bring deeper deliverance because it's one who's been delivered who can deliver. Okay, how can we deliver a city if we haven't been delivered ourselves? How can we deliver a nation if we haven't been delivered ourselves? Okay, and I know that the Lord is doing something within that place, and he's trying to open that up to us. And so um, one of the things I want to start with, I know the Lord's given me some words for some people here, but one of the things I feel that we need to start with, I'm going to have you stand, but we're going to actually need to kind of partner up perhaps to do this. And I took the prayer team through this last night is I, I got this um, out of Debbie Berto's book um, over in Modesto. Um, she just wrote this book, Back to the Altar. And 
And it has to do with, um, you know, it's a deliverance manual, actually. Um, but, but this whole thing about pride, um, pride is the strength of sin, is what she's writing in here. Uh, she's quoting Ed Cole. And she said, you know, um, uh, pride gets loose or kicked out of heaven, and it protects the sin in a person's life by preventing the person from confessing and admitting their sin or weakness. And to hate what God hates is to hate pride. And I felt like that was one of the first layers of things that God would want to deal with us so that he can actually begin to speak to us. I almost missed what that girl sent to me because of pride. You know, like, like that's crazy. You know, kind of like shutting it out because I think I know better or I'm not open to stuff like that because, you know, that's for the weird people. I mean, I, I, I have a grid for weird, but that's a little bit farther than I want to go. You know, there's a whole bunch of myriad of reasons that I almost missed that, you know, and um, it would have cost me something. And so I'm going to invite you to stand right now, and I'm going to read off a list of symptoms. And this is what we did in our prayer time last night, is I actually read off a list of, list of symptoms. And if any of those belong to you with your partner, your prayer partner, you're just going to tell them, you're just going to tell them that, you know, okay, I, this is the one, you know, check one, one, two, three, these three things that, you know, are something, some pride, areas of pride in my life. And, and then, um, so you're going to confess it. And then I'm going to lead all of us in, in a prayer to just renounce it and break that spirit off of our life. There really is spiritual dimensions to pride. Uh, Lucifer got kicked out of heaven because of pride. There's some very deep spiritual dimensions to pride. It's something we can't have in our life if we're actually going to go to the next place, okay? Now, remember the song we sang up front where mercy triumphs over judgment? Well, you are under the cover of mercy right now. You don't have to feel bad about yourself. You know, you can admit something under the, the mercy cover of God, right? Okay, um, and so let me read off these symptoms to you. Um, uh, arrogance and haughtiness, self-centeredness, self-righteousness, resistant to God's will, a condescending critical attitude towards others, bragging self-promotion, unable to receive correction instruction, inability to admit wrong or say I'm sorry, will make excuses or shift blame, that was mine, um, will not take responsibility for their actions, makes comparisons with others, keeps secrets or lacks transparency, is an interrupter, controls conversations, talks about themselves all the time, not a good listener, needs to be important, tries to be noticed, oversensitive, defensive, argumentative, that was mine too, harsh spirit, demands their way or refuses advice. And so if any of those were you, it's usually you'll have like three or four. Hopefully you don't have the whole list. You know, but if, it, if you do, just admit it. Just say, I'm, I'm the whole list, okay? But you want to turn to your partner. You just want to tell them, you know, A, B, C. And I'll, I'll give you a few moments to do that. Okay, remember you're under the cover of mercy, so you can, you can admit that. Now make sure you do that, okay? Don't be a loner in this.
Okay, well, some of you are telling people a lot. I want you to put your hand over your head. Put your, the other hand over your heart. Okay? And just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of pride. I renounce the spirit of pride in my life. And I break the yoke of pride right here and now in your presence. I command pride to leave in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, fill me with humility. Amen? Amen. All right, let's celebrate. I don't know who this is for. It might be for more than one of you, but I mean, like, for me to get eight points in the in the worship, come on, that's, that's God. He wants to get this one across. Um, but basically what he is saying is he, he wants to address the habit of comparing yourself to others and that you don't need to compare yourself to others. You just, you, that God gives you the standard and that's the standard that you need to, to adhere to. And he wants to assure you that he's, he will set you in your high places, um, that God's the one who places you there. You don't have to work yourself into it. You don't have to work it up um you know you just need to be faithful and then you will go deeper before you go higher and that is the process that will be in your life at all times it's, it's a process of going deeper before you go higher and that god loves you too much to promote you too soon the people took saul and they made him king and he wasn't ready and you don't want to be in that situation and that your test is the test of waiting. Can you wait? Can you wait for the Lord to open the door? And that, um, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a faithfulness test. It's a test of waiting. And about the time you don't care anymore will be the time. About the time you don't care anymore will be the time. Can I hear an amen? Amen. God is good.